This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled, What is Aplastic Anemia? From Diagnosis to Treatment. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onofre, Director of Patient Education at AAMDSIS, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our patients and families for making this webinar possible. Today's presenter is Dr. Akiko Shimomura. Dr. Shimomura directs the Bone Marrow Failure and MDS program of the Dana-Farmer and Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorder Center. Her research focuses on translational studies spanning clinical through basic science investigations to understand the genetic and molecular basis of bone marrow failure, such as MDS and leukemia predisposition, with the goal of developing more effective and less toxic treatments. Dr. Sherman Mora had previously directed the bone marrow failure clinic at Boston Children's Hospital and then at Seattle Children's Hospital before returning to Boston Children's Hospital in the fall of 2015. Dr. Sherman Mora has mentored numerous students and postdoctoral fellows who have moved on to careers in academics, medicine, or the biotechnology industry. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Shimamura. Thank you so much, Angie. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, uh, can, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, Terrific. So uh, I uh, will be speaking about aplastic anemia, talking initially about some diagnostic issues and then talking about treatment. It's difficult to tailor this uh, talk because people will be coming in at different sort of times within their treatments or with different sort of uh, needs, knowledge needs. So I tried to tailor the talk both to those who are new to aplastic anemia, as well as to put some of the cutting edge newest advances in the field for those who are sort of experienced aficionados in the field. So hopefully everyone will get something out of this. Um, and again, many thanks to the Aplastic and MDS Foundation for uh, supporting um, this educational effort. So on the next slide, uh, just to give you a sense of what the talk will cover, we'll talk briefly about what is aplastic anemia and talk about the difference between acquired and inherited aplastic anemia. It was previously thought that sort of these genetic disorders are very rare, but uh, we're becoming increasingly aware that uh, many of these uh, genetic disorders masquerade as uh, sort of run-of-the-mill aplastic anemia. We'll try to understand the relationship between aplastic anemia, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or PNH, and myelodysplastic syndrome, or MDS. We'll also talk about treatment options and advances in treatment for aplastic anemia. Uh, we'll talk about some efforts uh, to advance our um, armamentarium for personalized medicine for aplastic anemia. By personalized medicine, we're trying to understand how we can individually tailor uh, therapeutic and management options specifically for an individual patient. And then finally, we'll briefly talk about how you can take an active role in your care. So just by starters, aplastic anemia is one of the most dramatic things that we as doctors see when we look under the microscope. So on the left-hand side, you see a healthy bone marrow. So this is a bone marrow biopsy. Uh, the big pink uh, uh, flat parts, that's the bony trabeculi that traverses your bone marrow, which is the inside squishy part of your bones, where the blood cells are made. And you can see that a healthy marrow is full of blood-producing cells on the left. In contrast, on the right is an aplastic anemia bone marrow where the blood cells are gone. It's empty and it's just full of fat. Um, and so basically, they, uh, this empty marrow with uh, devoid of blood, produce, blood production uh, results in low peripheral blood counts. So there are three major types of blood counts, and I'll go through this quickly uh, since most of you know about this. Neutrophils, which have lots of other names, granulocytes, polys, PMNs, eggs, basically fight infection, mostly bacteria and fungus, by engulfing and eating them. And generally, the lower the number of neutrophils, the higher the potential risk of infection. And uh, although the risk of infection is not 
just a numbers game, right? I've seen patients with really severe uh, what we call neutropenia, which refers to low neutrophil counts, really severe neutropenia with no infections. And I've seen some patients with moderate neutropenia have severe infections. But it's just kind of a guideline that the lower the neutrophil count, the more you are at risk for infection. The platelets are those little tiny cells. I've magnified them there on the left that help the blood to clot. Uh, and basically, again, the lower your platelet count, the higher your risk of bleeding. And although it's a continuum, right, it's not that, you know, there's a sudden cutoff that suddenly when you fall below 50,000, your risk goes way higher. It's just the lower you go, the higher the risk. And so it's sort of been uh, parsed out into sort of mildly increased bleeding risk, moderately increased bleeding risk, and significantly increased bleeding risk. Again, as you go down in platelet count from 100,000 down to less than 10 or 20,000. The last type of blood cell is the red blood cell. These um, uh, carry oxygen throughout the body. And so if you don't have enough red blood cells, you don't get enough oxygen to your organs and tissues, and you can present with fatigue, pallor, lightheadedness. Um, I had one patient who actually fainted because she just couldn't carry enough oxygen to her brain at the time. So um, uh, we want to avoid severe uh, anemia. Uh, the reticulocytes, which you might hear about, are these young newly produced red blood cells, and we see them often when the bone marrow is churning out uh, red blood cells. You'll see the reticulocytes, which are the young red cells, going up. So one uh, question that I'm faced with a lot when people see their blood count sort of lab reports is lots of cells are often, lots of lab values are often flagged as abnormal, yet your doctor is not getting particularly excited. Why might that be? Well, when labs report that a blood count is abnormal, they're using statistical abnormality as their marker of what's normal or abnormal. They're not paying attention to whether it's significant at all, whether it means anything clinically to a patient. It's based on statistics. So uh, basically, if I took your neutrophil counts, right, and I took neutrophil counts of a whole lot of healthy people, you'll see that uh, most people will have neutrophil counts that fall within the middle of a bell-shaped curve. Um, but by definition, there are some patients who are perfectly healthy, 2.5% of them will fall below uh, what we call normal, and 2.5% will fall above what we call normal. So you can be a perfectly healthy person, but statistically, some of you will fall below or above what is flagged as normal. So we don't get excited about the blood counts until they fall low enough to cause problems. And I, I had given in the previous slide some general sense of what we consider, you know, worrisome. So platelet counts less than 150 to 100,000, uh, neutrophil counts less than 1,500 to 1,000, and, platelet, uh, and uh, a hemoglobin that's less than what would be age appropriate. That varies with age and gender. So now that we've defined the blood counts, let's talk about causes of aplastic anemia. So one of the first questions that we have to deal with is, is the marrow intrinsically healthy? It's just that something else has happened to that healthy marrow. And if we get rid of that something else, the healthy marrow can recover. This is as opposed to, is there something intrinsically going on with the bone marrow, right? So the most common sort of things that we see with a healthy bone marrow, but for some reason it's not working well, is infections, that's a top one, medications, uh, toxins, autoimmune diseases, and uh, there can be a variety of other things. And the key to this is uh, you can cure the aplastic anemia if you get rid of the inciting event. So if the marrow is being suppressed because of an infection, often the marrow will recover once you treat the infection. If it's caused by medications, the marrow will recover when you stop the medications, although not always. Um, so uh, it changes how we uh, treat and manage um, aplastic anemia. In contrast, if the marrow is intrinsically having something go wrong with it, uh, you can think about it as an acquired aplastic anemia or sort of a genetic aplastic anemia. In acquired aplastic anemia, the, the majority of them, we have no idea what caused it. Um, there are some that are thought to be caused by an autoimmune attack, that is an, an attack by your very own immune system against your bone marrow. There are some acquired aplastic anemias that occur after a bout of hepatitis. 
We don't understand why that happens. Um, they usually cannot identify an organism that caused the hepatitis, uh, but it does happen, and it usually happens after the hepatitis has gone away and gotten better. And then lastly, there's this phenomenon that I'll talk to you about, the PNH, the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then in this last category, the genetic disorders, there's a bunch of genetic um, gene, uh, uh, disorders that can manifest with aplastic anemia. And the important thing to remember here is, in the old days, we thought that we could recognize these genetic aplastic anemia syndromes because often they present with other findings. Um, they can have abnormal kidneys or abnormal um, heart, abnormal hands or feet. But we're finding out now uh, that we have better tests that actually people who, for all the world, look like your run-of-the-mill standard aplastic anemia can actually have a genetic cause. So um, just something to be aware of. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we'll talk about why that's important. So just a couple of words about PNH. PNH is a syndrome that is characterized by three clinical features. Hemolytic anemia, meaning your blood counts are, your red blood count is low, but it's low because they're being destroyed prematurely and their destruction is causing the anemia. This is very different from aplastic anemia, where the blood counts are low because your bone marrow is not producing the blood cells. So here your bone marrow is producing the blood cells sometimes, but the red blood cells are getting destroyed. These patients can also develop blood clots. And then lastly, these patients can actually also develop aplastic anemia, where now it's just not a destruction problem. The bone marrow actually stops producing the blood cells. You can have any one of these or all of them. PNH is caused by a problem with making something called GPI. It has a very long name, but it's abbreviated GPI. And GPI is in basically an anchor that is found on the surfaces of your cells uh, that anchors other important proteins to the surface of your cells. Uh, and so if that GPI is gone, it can't anchor anymore these other proteins to the surface of the cells. Now, this is important because one of the things that we rely on GPI to anchor is something called CD55 and CD59. Those are just fancy names for proteins that we would like to have uh, on the surfaces of our red blood cells. And the reason is there's something that your immune system makes called complement, which is designed to um, attack uh, infections, right? And it does not, it knows not to attack your red blood cells because CD55 and CD59, those proteins, are present. If CD55 and CD59 are absent from the surface of your red blood cells because you can't make GPI, now suddenly complement can go and destroy your red blood cells. So, um, so that's how you get uh, anemia, for example, with PNH. Um, now, it is very common in aplastic anemia to have some PNH cells, we call them clones, but PNH cells there, cells that are lacking these cell surface anchors. Usually the percentage of what we call these PNH cells are very small and they don't cause problems. They don't cause you to clot. They don't cause you to have destruction of your red cells. You don't have symptoms because there's only a few of these cells around. But sometimes people can present with lots of these PNH cells or the PNH cells can increase over time. So as long as the P number of PNH cells is very small and you don't have any other symptoms, you're not having blood clots, you're not destroying your red blood cells, we treat the aplastic anemia, even with the presence of this small number of PNH cells, we treat them the same as everybody else with aplastic anemia. It doesn't need anything else. However, if you have a really a lot of PNH cells or if you're having symptoms such as blood clots or red cell destruction, then you have to consider medications such as eculizumab, usually uh, together with a bone marrow transplant to treat the aplastic anemia. So uh, this is a whole separate talk. I'm not going to talk about that. The take-home point here is if you have aplastic anemia with a big PNH clone or you have symptoms of PNH with your aplastic anemia, you need to go talk to a specialist in uh, PNH. Now, the scary, one of the most ominous potential risks of aplastic anemia uh, 
is that uh, a subset of patients, somewhere around 15%, we think, uh, but that number is a soft number. We're still trying to understand exactly how many patients. But anyway, around 15% of patients with aplastic anemia will go on to develop uh, something called MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a pre-leukemia syndrome. These patients are at risk for developing leukemia. They have low blood counts because of this pre-leukemic disorder, uh, and uh, they um, can have abnormalities in the bone marrow where the bone marrow looks funny, and you can have chromosomal abnormalities uh, that can put them at risk for developing leukemia. So uh, this is, of course, a much riskier um, situation than aplastic anemia because now you have to worry about leukemia, uh, and we'll talk about that um, at the end. Um, uh, and this is just a couple of pictures of some of the funny-looking cells that you can see with MDS. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time there uh, because I can't point to anything. Uh, but these are some abnormal platelet-producing cells. In the middle panel are the normal ones. And on the little uh, boxes are the abnormal ones. And then on the uh, lower right are some abnormal neutrophils where instead of having a normal nucleus, you see these two little blobs of nuclei connected with a little strand, and um, you can see a lot of those with MDS. So we look carefully at how the marrow and the peripheral blood looks. We also look at the chromosomes. So uh, we all have uh, two sets of each chromosome, uh, and uh, if uh, there is sort of a pre-leukemic or leukemic or malignant process, sometimes uh, you can tell that because you develop chromosomal abnormalities. So on the right, you can see that chromosome 7, where you're supposed to have two copies of chromosome 7, now suddenly you're missing one copy of chromosome 7. And with chromosome 3, you can see that there's part of one chromosome 3 that got removed and stuck onto the other copy of chromosome 3. So we'll see a lot of structural abnormalities, losses of chromosomes, uh, when you start to see often MDS or leukemia but you don't have to have chromosomal abnormalities to have MDS or leukemia. And then this is, of course, our most worrisome uh, potential complication, which is leukemia itself, and these are just some pictures of some leukemia cells. So why do we care about these genetic causes of aplastic anemia? And the reason is, uh, the diagnosis of a genetic cause of aplastic anemia can inform our choice of treatment and inform optimal surveillance strategies. And by that I mean um, patients with these genetic causes of aplastic anemia either don't respond or have only a, par uh, a partial or transient response to the standard medical therapy that we use for aplastic anemia. So we usually treat aplastic anemia with either a bone marrow transplant or ATG and cyclosporin, and we'll talk about the choice of those treatments in a moment. But patients with these genetic aplastic anemias don't respond very well to ATG and cyclosporin, if at all. So it would be nice to know that you had a genetic cause of your aplastic anemia, so we don't put you through that treatment, but rather go to other more effective treatments right off the bat. Patients with these genetic causes of aplastic anemia are also at higher risk of MDS and leukemia. So I showed you a 15% risk on that other slide. These patients can have a much higher risk of developing MDS or leukemia. And so uh, we would want to take steps to um, monitor for that so we can intervene early before the leukemia develops. And sometimes that will also influence our choice of therapy. Uh, thirdly, uh, if we are to do a transplant for standard aplastic anemia, uh, these regimens, these standard transplant regimens, can be highly toxic for some of these genetic forms of aplastic anemia. So you wouldn't want to choose you know, the usual transplant regimen. You would want a specialized transplant regimen so that it's not so toxic, right? And we call these reduced intensity conditioning regimens. So if you knew up front that, uh, that you were at high risk for toxicity, the, the knowledge of that would allow you to choose a different kind of transplant regimen. It also informs choice of donor. So if you have a family member donor and you know there's a genetic cause, you would want to test the family member for the same genetic cause, even if they're, they don't have aplastic anemia. And then lastly, it allows for family counseling um, because sometimes uh, 
families uh, might want to, for example, bank cord blood if they know that there's a genetic marrow failure syndrome. It, it, it gives you more options on what to do. So what are some clues to a genetic form of aplastic anemia? Some of these patients will have uh, physical uh, findings. Sometimes, as I said before, there can be abnormal kidneys, abnormal heart. Uh, they can sometimes have very characteristic birthmarks. So the birthmarks are very common. My children have birthmarks, so do not panic if you have a birthmark. It doesn't mean you have a genetic abnormality. Uh, but if we saw that with aplastic anemia, we would run certain tests. Um, some people have immune problems. Some people have uh, problems with their eyes, their ears, their teeth, almost anything. So we pay a lot of attention to um, the physical exam and clinical history. Some people are just unusually short or they're not growing well as a manifestation of their genetic aplastic anemia. And some people, you get a clue from their family history. So they have a close family member who also had aplastic anemia or had low blood counts that didn't cause any problems for them, but the counts are not normal. A close family member with cancer is a clue to these genetic aplastic anemia syndromes, especially if the cancer was presenting at an unusually young age or if the cancer was not, the treatment for the cancer had a lot of toxicity, was unusually toxic. Uh, and then lastly, physical anomalies, even in a close family member, can be another clue that maybe we need to look harder for a genetic cause of the aplastic anemia because we treat it very differently. So I'm talking about genetics. Why don't we take a step back and just make sure we all are on the same page about what is a gene? So a gene is a unit of information that's encoded in your chromosomes. And your chromosomes are made up of DNA, right? So it's a unit of information. For example, your genes are what determine your eye color, your height, your skin color, everything about you, right? Um, or most, many things about you are determined by your genes. A mutation refers to a malfunction in the gene. Uh, we all carry some mutations. We all have some genes that don't work properly, but most of these don't really seem to cause health problems. And we know that because now we're able to sequence all the genes, uh, and we found out that most of us carry, and we all carry some mutations, right? So it's, it's just part of being human. Um, our chromosomes also include a lot of extra DNA that don't encode information. So the way I explain this is your genes are like watching a TV show, right? In between the actual TV show, you can have commercials that don't inform the TV show, right? It has nothing to do with the TV show. It's the same with your chromosomes. They contain genes, and then they contain a lot of extra stuff, a lot of extra DNA that don't contain information, or we don't know what information that they contain. We don't understand them. Uh, and so when we talk about exomes, the reason I brought that up is, you know, there's a lot of stuff about 23andMe and, you know, is sequencing all the genes in the, that you have. Those are referred to as exomes. They're only talking about the part that we think encodes information, right? So theoretically, when we talk about sequencing all your exomes, uh, it's supposed to include all your genes um, in theory. So uh, in this day and age, we can diagnose genetic causes of aplastic anemia using a couple of different approaches, but one major approach is to do genetic testing. We can do gene panels. You have to be very careful to go to a center with expertise in these types of analysis because there's a ton and just more and more gene panels are popping up in uh, you know, the commercial labs every day. And they're all different. They contain different genes. They contain different regions of different genes. They um, don't always uh, test for something that you need to be tested for. And they also have varying uh, levels of expertise in analyzing the genes. It's a very rapidly moving field. So be careful. And I always recommend that you seek consultation with an expert if you're going to undergo this kind of analysis so that you can make sure that the right gene panel, the most, you know, thorough analysis is undertaken. I also want to put a little caveat out there because whole exome sequencing has been marketed as, you know, a way for you to analyze all your genes, and that is an oversimplification. There's a lot that's missed on these whole exome sequencing, and some of the analyses are um, not tailored for 
aplastic anemia. So um, if you do do whole exome sequencing, have it reviewed and analyzed by an expert. And uh, ideally, you should talk to an expert before even going to whole exome sequencing. And I would say that it's best to go to an expert in genetic analysis of aplastic anemia. If you go to a standard geneticist, they may or may not know the field of aplastic anemia, and um, some of some patients have um, not uh, gotten as much out of the whole exome sequencing, or even perhaps gotten erroneous information um, because their physician wasn't an expert in this disease. There is, these are rare. Um, it never hurts to talk to an expert. So when do we treat aplastic anemia? So if it's what we call severe or very severe aplastic anemia, where the blood counts are so low that you either need transfusions or you have symptoms from your low blood counts, so you're having infections because of your neutropenia, you're tired because of your anemia, uh, you have some bruising or bleeding from your low platelets, or if your blood counts are so low that you're at high risk for these kinds of complications, then we will consider treatment. And the reason that we wait until the blood counts are low or you're having symptoms is that all treatments have side effects. So if you're not having problems with your blood counts, even if they're not normal, uh, most physicians uh, would be reluctant to expose you to toxicities that you don't need because you're doing fine with your abnormal, albeit abnormal, but asymptomatic low blood counts. So the major decision that is faced up front in terms of treatment is the decision between going to bone marrow transplant versus what we call immunosuppressive therapy with ATG and cyclosporin. And this decision uh, depends on your likelihood of uh, survival uh, based on each of these two treatments and a comparison of the long-term and short-term potential complications. And the outcomes with respect to survival and complications varies depending on a lot of different things. Your age, younger is better for bone marrow transplant, what kind of donor you have for your transplant. So if you have a matched sibling who's healthy and is a full match, transplant outcomes are outstanding for that as opposed to somebody who does has a less desirable donor. And what your health is. You know, it's uh, transplant complications can be very severe and risks can be high if you have health problems, right? So um, a lot of this is determined by how likely you are to tolerate a transplant. Why do we consider transplant so seriously? That's because transplant is the only truly curative therapy for aplastic anemia. ATG and cyclosporin can improve your blood counts, and in a subset of patients, a few patients can even have normal blood counts sometimes, uh, but there's always a risk of relapse, and there's the risk of progressing to this pre-leukemia, the MDS, um, or even full-blown leukemia, uh, and some people don't respond to ATG cyclosporin. Some people respond, but their counts are still really low. So bone marrow transplant is really the curative option of choice if you have a good donor, you're young, and you're healthy, right? So survival can be as high as 95% um, for children and young adults. Um, and in some of the more recent studies, there are some studies reporting 100% survival, but, you know, nothing in life is 100%. So, you know, it still carries some risk. For matched, if you have a matched sibling donor, and we'll talk about what matching is in a moment, um, we are able to use regimens, transplant regimens, that do not include radiation. So uh, often, we, and they don't include the use of high-dose chemotherapy. So using these sort of uh, milder regimens, uh, often the long-term complications are low. Uh, patients grow normally. If they're a child, they develop normally. They maintain fertility, et cetera. Um, so generally, we use matched sibling transplant for first-line therapy for young patients, which is typically defined as people less than 40 years of age, but nowadays we're even doing older patients, you know, age less than 50 and even older sometimes. It depends. And the reason that we do this for young patients is the transplant risks are low for a healthy patient with a matched sibling donor. 
Um, the risks that we worry about are graft failure, meaning the new bone marrow doesn't, doesn't grow in the patient, something called graft versus host disease, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and any kind of toxicities from the transplant, right? So toxicities are low. Now, what happens if you are older or you simply don't want to take even a small risk with a matched sibling transplant or uh, you're not healthy enough to tolerate a transplant? Well, then usually, uh, so far, the second-line therapy has been immunosuppressive therapy with ATG and cyclosporin. About over two-thirds of patients will respond. By response, uh, this is defined very broadly, so we need to be clear on that. It does not mean that your counts go back to normal necessarily. It can, but for most patients, the blood counts remain abnormal. Uh, it's just that you no longer need transfusions and you're no longer at high risk for infection, right? So um, often the counts don't go to normal, uh, but also sometimes they do. Responses are typically delayed, so you start the medications, but often you don't see an improvement in blood counts for another two or three months. So it's a slow therapy. Even if you respond, about 30% of patients will relapse, meaning their counts will drop again. Uh, the risk of developing MDS or leukemia is about 15%. We don't think that this is related to the treatment. We think that it's an underlying predisposition with aplastic anemia because other patients are treated for other reasons with ATG and cyclosporin, and those patients don't develop leukemia. So uh, we think that this is an intrinsic risk uh, associated with aplastic anemia and not caused by treatment. The overall survival with ATG and cyclosporin is 80%. Survival is really great at 10 years, 95%, if there's no relapse or progression to MDS or AML. And of course, the survival is worse if you develop uh, MDS or AML. So patients who develop uh, these complications are at higher risk for complications. It doesn't mean you won't survive it, but it, it, it's, um, it's a more challenging treatment. So what is ATG? ATG is uh, basically serum antibodies harvested from either horses or rabbits. Uh, and we use horses in the U.S. because the rate of response, and this was shown in a beautiful uh, uh, publication in the New England Journal of Medicine from uh, the group at NIH um, showing that responses to horse ATG are twice as good as responses with rabbit ATG. So we use horse. Um, however, it's not without toxicity. So ATG can cause uh, an allergic reaction. I mean, you're, you're getting horse serum. So uh, you can have a lot of uh, allergic reactions to that. Uh, you can also get fevers, rashes. You, you can feel like you have the flu, and it's because these immune complexes can deposit in your muscles and joints. It can cause inflammation of the GI tract. Sometimes it can cause uh, neurologic inflammation, so you can get headaches, vomiting. Uh, but it's usually transient, and it usually gets better. Uh, one thing I tell patients is the blood counts often get worse before they get better because the horse serum, serum can attack the blood cells for a little while until you clear the horse antibodies. So I tell patients, don't panic if your counts get worse before they get better. Uh, and because the uh, antibodies attack your immune cells, you will be at risk for infection until you recover your blood counts and clear the, the ATG. Cyclosporin is an oral medication that is started, so ATG is given into a vein. It's an intravenous medicine, usually given over four days. Cyclosporin is an oral medicine, which is an immunosuppressive medicine. Uh, again, the risk is it increases your risk of infection. Uh, it can be associated uh, particularly at high doses with high blood pressure, kidney toxicity, low magnesium. Uh, it can increase sort of body hair, facial hair. It can cause swollen gums. Sometimes there can be some neurologic toxicities. Uh, but usually that can be minimized by careful attention to magnesium and electrolytes. Um, some patients, we try to treat with cyclosporin for a while, and then we'll try to taper it. And we try to taper it so that patients can come off, but some patients cannot come off cyclosporin and have to remain on cyclosporin indefinitely. 
Um, but at low levels, usually if you can get the dose down, um, patients can tolerate cyclosporin for years and years and years without a lot of side effects. Uh, these side effects are mostly a problem at high initial starting doses of cyclosporin. Now, what happens if you don't respond? We call that refractory aplastic anemia. We usually give people three to six months to respond. I've seen a couple patients who continue to have improving blood counts after six months, but if there's no response, you're still transfusion dependent, you still have really low blood counts by three to six months after starting ATG cyclosporin, you need to think about doing something else. And the reason is the longer you delay definitive therapy, the higher your risks become of complications. For example, if you're sitting around for months and months and months with very low neutrophils, your, your chances of developing a life-threatening infection with bacteria or fungus goes up. And even if you develop uh, a non-life-threatening infection, uh, that can increase your risk with subsequent therapies of complications. So, for example, going into transplant with a history of a fungal infection increases your risk of transplant. doesn't mean we can't get you through transplant successfully. We can, but the risks are higher. Um, so uh, similarly, if you keep getting chronic transfusions for a long, 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 long time, you can start to run into complications, which we'll talk about. So for young patients who don't respond to ATG and cyclosporin, uh, we would consider an unrelated donor. And that's because the outcomes with an unrelated matched, an unrelated matched donor, and we'll talk about this in a moment, the outcomes are outstanding. As a matter of fact, they're so great that um, there's, we're even thinking uh, whether we should be deferring this for refractory disease, and I'll talk about that in a moment. For older patients or patients who lack a good matched unrelated donor, by unrelated I mean they're not a family member, then you could consider a second course of ATG and cyclosporin. Sometimes instead of horse, the second time around, we'll try rabbit ATG. Uh, and of those patients who are refractory, uh, it's reported in the adult literature that 30 to 40% of patients will respond. The literature is not so great in children. Um, so in children, because the responses don't appear to be so high uh, and because they do well with unrelated donor transplants, we typically will go to an unrelated donor transplant. And then there are other treatments that we can consider for refractory aplastic anemia, which we'll talk about in a minute. But first, let's talk about transplant. So a bone marrow transplant, this is a schematic diagram of blood cell production. So in your bone marrow, you have sort of these cells that we call stem cells. These are cells that can replenish themselves. They can make more stem cells. And they can also give rise to all of the different blood cells in your body. So they're responsible for producing all of your blood cells. Um, what happens in aplastic anemia is you're not producing blood cells, right? So there's something wrong with your blood production. So we want to get rid of the sick bone marrow and replace it with a healthy bone marrow or stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, blood producing stem cells from a healthy donor, right? So that's the whole idea behind a hematopoietic, meaning blood producing stem cell transplant. Just uh, because I've been asked this, a transplant does not involve transplanting bones. There's no surgery involved. The bone marrow is that you know, liquid inner part of your bone marrow where the blood cells are. So we remove that just like when you have a bone marrow exam. We remove that from the donors, and they can also have other types of cells removed um, from a vein. Uh, and those are collected. It looks like a bag of blood, but it's bone marrow cells, and those are infused into the patient's vein, almost like a blood transfusion, but somehow these amazing blood-producing stem cells know that they need to go to the bone marrow and start producing blood cells. So even though we stick it into your vein, they go to your bone marrow. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about matching? Well, there are these um, markers on the surfaces of all of our cells, well, almost all of our cells, called HLA markers, HLA. Uh, which stands for major, major histocompatibility complex, uh, antigen, sorry. Uh, and uh, our HLA type is specific to ourselves, and that's how our body, our immune system, knows to recognize self from non-self, and it knows not to attack its own cells that are um, bearing its own HLA cell markers, right? 
uh, these HLA markers are transmitted genetically. We inherit them from our parents. That's why matched sibling donors are truly a match because if they're matched and there are siblings, they've inherited the exact same HLA genes from the parents, right? Now, not all siblings inherit the same HLA type um, from parents, uh, and we can go into the genetics later, but there's about a 25% chance that any given sibling will be HLA matched. The HLA type um, determines two things. If they're uh, not matched, there's a chance that the patient, the host, will reject the new donor marrow. It'll recognize the incoming marrow is foreign and reject it. We call that graft rejection. There's also a chance that the new donor cells, the new marrow, will look around and recognize, hey, I'm not in my own body. This looks weird. And it'll start to attack the patient's cells. This is called graft versus host disease, where the new donor graft is basically uh, mounting an immune attack of the patient. And this manifests as an autoimmune disease. It can be very mild or very severe, but we want to avoid both graft rejection as well as graft versus host disease by matching the HLA type. Now, just briefly, I don't know how granular to get, but there's something called low resolution HLA typing, high resolution HLA typing, and even with high resolution, you can look for six antigens or 10 antigens um, or eight antigens. So just to give you a sense that there is sort of different uh, granularity of matching, and um, most centers are doing, uh, well, all centers are doing high resolution typing, and most of us will match for at least, uh, uh, will match for 10 antigens, but at least we'll do six, six to eight. So... Um, what are our options for donors? So your options are, if you're lucky enough to have an identical twin, that might be an option for you. Uh, and there, the HLA type is absolutely identical. HLA-matched siblings have identical HLA types. Um, however, um, it's still possible, even with a matched sibling, to have complications with transplant. So just because you have an HLA-matched sib doesn't mean you're at zero risk with transplant. Uh, but uh, um, the outcomes, as I showed you, are outstanding. Um, uh, HLA-matched unrelated donors are basically people in the registry, so very generous people uh, offer to donate bone marrow, if, uh, and so they register in the National Marrow Donor Registry, and if they are an HLA match, uh, they can donate bone marrow for, or uh, sometimes they can actually donate uh, blood-derived stem cells, so that's a peripheral blood stem cell transplant, um, and uh, those can be used as donors. The issue is, although they're HLA matched, they're not genetically totally identical the way a matched sibling is. These people haven't uh, inherited the exact same genes from your parents the way your siblings have. So there is an increased risk of graft versus host disease and graft rejection and other complications uh, with an unrelated donor, but if they're totally HLA matched, we've gotten so good at these transplants that the transplant outcomes are looking almost identical to those with matched siblings. So uh, this is an exciting time in bone marrow transplant with all these advances. In the old days, back when I trained, you know, 20 years ago, we would try our best not to use an unrelated donor, but now we go to them uh, much faster. Uh, and then if you don't have an HLA, oh, I forgot to put on here, I'm sorry, there should be cord blood transplants. So you can actually get umbilical cord blood stem cells um, that are available through cord blood banks. And then if you don't have that, there's also mismatched donors uh, that you can use. Um, those are more complicated. Uh, and sometimes we'll even use somebody who's only half matched. So Every parent almost is half matched with their child. There are exceptions to that, but um, uh, so a parent could theoretically uh, donate uh, for their child, but that is a more complicated transplant, but we're getting better and better at those. Uh, so in thinking about the algorithm, if there's a matched sibling, of which there's about a 20% uh, of patients have a matched sibling, that would be our first line for transplants. 
If there's no HLA match, sibling will typically go to immunosuppressive therapy, but if, there, if the patient is, doesn't respond to that or relapses and doesn't respond to treatment of relapse, uh, consideration could be given to unrelated donor transplant if they're HLA matched or to alternative donors such as HLA mismatch donors, cord blood transplants, or haploidentical donors, the half-matched donors. So I'm just trying to give you a sense here of some of the algorithms that we go through when we consider uh, what uh, treatment options you might want to pursue. And it's very important that you have a talk with your doctor about specifically all of the treatment options and the risks and benefits of each treatment option specifically for you because this is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, this has to be individualized. So when we do a transplant, before we give the new marrow, we have to do something called conditioning. So conditioning has three purposes. Number one, we want to suppress the patient's immune system. Uh, and this is to prevent you from rejecting the donor marrow, right? So we suppress this to prevent graft rejection. We want you to accept the new marrow. We also have to get rid of the unhealthy marrow. You know, there's a non-functioning sort of sick marrow. We need to get rid of it. So it's myeloablation, and it also kind of makes room for the new incoming marrow. And then if somebody has MDS or leukemia, we also have to kill off those uh, malignant cells. So uh, we have to give a much more intensive conditioning regimen when we're dealing with MDS or leukemia as opposed to aplastic anemia, where we don't have to worry about getting rid of malignant cells, right? So a transplant for MD, once someone has progressed to MDS or leukemia, it is a much more intensive transplant with a lot more toxicity. The way we achieve um, all of these three things um, is with radiation um, and or chemotherapy. And whether or not you need radiation and how much chemo you need will depend on the type of donor that you have um, and your underlying disease. So matched sibling transplant, for example, we can typically do without radiation. We do with low-dose chemo, very well tolerated typically. So uh, this is just to give you a sense of the tempo of a stem cell transplant. So, you know, you come in with your blood counts wherever they are. Uh, if, you're a, if you have aplastic anemia, they're going to be low when you come in. Um, so, uh, and we give you your conditioning with chemotherapy with or without radiation, and your counts are going to drop because we're getting rid of your unhealthy marrow. And then we come in and infuse your donor marrow on day zero. And then over time, and it takes, you know, a couple of weeks usually, uh, the donor marrow starts to grow and produce blood cells. And then over the course of a few weeks, the donor cells will come in. Uh, and uh, we worry about different things at different points. So, for example, within the first week or two after starting transplant, when your counts are really low, before your donor cells have started to work, you're at high risk for infection. You're at risk for some of the side effects of um, chemotherapy or radiation. It can be toxic to your kidneys or your heart or your lungs. So that's where we sometimes see that. And then as the graft comes in, that's where graft versus host disease can, can develop um, because the new graft is coming in. So just to give you a sense of the time frame of things. Complications can occur early or late. Some of the early uh, complications are what I just talked to you about, graft-versus-host disease, graft rejection, failure, infections, organ toxicity, and if you have a malignant MDS or leukemia, we can see relapse. Long-term effects, uh, again, you can have chronic graft-versus-host disease. You can have infections if your graft isn't working well or you have graft-versus-host disease. There are more long-term organ toxicities that can cause a decreased function of your endocrine organs. Um, sometimes you can have uh, some end organ toxicity of your heart, your lungs, your uh, liver, depending on um, what kind of regimen was used and how healthy you were going into the transplant. And uh, in some cases, there can be an increased risk of solid tumors with, certain, uh, with some of these transplant regimens. So you want to talk to your doctor about the specific transplant regimen they might be talking about with you. What are some of the early uh, potential uh, toxicities and side effects? And then what are some of the late ones? And that will vary 
depending on your health, depending on what's causing your aplastic anemia, is it genetic, is it not, um, depending on the type of donor and the type of transplant regimen, and whether the transplant is for MDS or leukemia versus aplastic anemia. Uh, moving on then, there are other options for refractory aplastic anemia. Alemtuzumab, also called CAMPATH, is an immunosuppressive agent that can uh, give a 30 to 40 percent response in adults. It's not been studied carefully in children. Cyclophosphamide is a chemotherapeutic agent. It has been used at high dose, which almost get rid of, gets rid of your marrow, but not quite, and it allows your marrow to eventually grow back. Uh, and often it sort of resets the immune system is sort of the thought, uh, and uh, patients can respond to cyclophosphamide. The issue with cyclophosphamide is it can take a really, really long time to recover, particularly the neutrophil counts. And so um, generally this is best done uh, on a study, an investigational study. And Johns Hopkins has really been leading that. Uh, effort to study a cyclophosphamide to treat aplastic anemia. So if you're interested in that, um, I recommend you call Johns Hopkins. Um, L-trombopag is uh, a very exciting agent. Uh, it is an agent that stimulates blood-producing stem cells, um, and it's given orally, which is great. Uh, and there have been really nice responses going to the next slide. Sorry, let me go to the next slide. Uh, at the NIH, where they were the first group to start trying to use this, uh, and it's been very exciting, where 43 patients who were either relapsed or refractory to other treatments for aplastic anemia. So these are patients who, in the old days, we really didn't have a whole lot of options other than transplant. These patients, 40% um, of them, 17 of 43, had some sort of response within three to four months of starting l -trombopag. Now, response was defined very broadly. So, um, you know, it's just important to remember what we're calling a response. Response included um, decrease in number of transfusions you need, you know, decreased frequency of transfusions. So you could still be transfusion dependent, but just not needing as many transfusions, and that still counted as a response. Uh, but overall, most patients had actually an improvement in their blood counts, and seven of them had improvement in all three cell lines, so the neutrophils, the red cells, and the platelets. So that was very exciting indeed. Some patients, even after three or four months, continued to slowly improve their blood counts with ongoing treatment. And some patients were even able to stop l trombopag and still maintain their blood counts. Again, this is small numbers. It, this is early days, yet we don't have a lot of patient follow-up, uh, but very exciting. Side effects uh, were basically uh, liver um, toxicity, but that was reversible. When you held the drug, uh, that recovered, and it didn't cause any significant liver um, problems. It was more a laboratory abnormality. Uh, I think the most uh, concerning potential issue to consider is uh, there were about 10% of patients, uh, in this case 20% of patients, who developed uh, uh, clonal cytogenetic abnormalities, chromosomal abnormalities, in some cases um, MDS. Uh, and as I told you, the outcomes of MDS are inferior to that with aplastic anemia. So this uh, pretty high rate of clonal progression um, has been described with aplastic anemia, so you could argue this is just what we see with aplastic anemia, but it is it does give you pause that this was seen quite early, um, but maybe it's just because these patients had refractory disease. Maybe they have more severe disease, so I think we need to study this more. Uh, it's not that we shouldn't consider l trombopag uh, I would encourage you, if at all possible, to enroll on a clinical study so that we, uh, as you receive your treatments, that information is collected and pooled with information from all other patients receiving these treatments so that we can learn from this and improve things going forward, hopefully for you, but uh, certainly for uh, uh, patients in the future. There is an upfront trial. I wanted to let people know there is a trial at NIH going on where they're studying whether giving l trombopag uh, as first-line therapy in combination with ATG and cyclosporin, whether that can improve 
outcomes. And so that is ongoing. It's not published yet. It's been presented at meetings. It's very exciting, uh, but it's not published yet. And it's not, uh, so it's, uh, I mention it here basically to encourage you to go talk to the NIH if you have any interest in enrolling on their study. For pediatrics, there will be other studies opening shortly across the nation, so stay tuned. Uh, now, there was great excitement in the aplastic anemia field with some data coming from Europe as well as from the United States showing that outcomes with matched unrelated donor transplants were comparable, were superimposable upon outcomes with uh, match sibling transplants, and that what we call event-free survival, meaning um, free of complications such as relapse, MDS, leukemia, uh, event-free survival was superior with matched unrelated donor transplants. In the old days, we would never have gone to this first line because uh, there it was a risky procedure. Uh, but now with these outcomes, uh, we don't know whether we should be offering this earlier or not. And so there is a clinical trial ongoing in the pediatric and young adult population comparing head-to-head, -head, some patients being randomized to receive ATG and cyclosporin, and others for whom a matched unrelated donor is available. Um, or I think it also allows a, uh, a 9 of 10 mismatch can go to transplant. Um, and... Uh, the diagnostic workup has to be done quickly because, you know, we want to get patients to transplant quickly. Um, now, the nice thing about transplant is, as I showed you, once the transplant is done, the count recovery is pretty fast. You don't have to wait three months for your counts to start recovering. So, um, you know, there are some advantages there, but there is a delay, right? You have to identify a donor. You've got to work up the donor. Um, so there's a delay to getting to transplant. So, uh, you know, it, it's really uh, going to be important to sort of see from this study uh, which of these uh, two treatment regimens is superior or maybe they're equivalent, and it's it's uh, patient's choice, so stay tuned. But I would recommend if you're interested in transplant uh, to enroll on a study so that we learn something from this. Now, finally, there's a lot of uh, buzz going on in the oncology field of precision medicine. This refers to individually tailored treatment strategies. So rather than a one-size-fits-all where everybody with a certain disease gets the same treatment, we're trying to risk stratify based on, um, in this case, usually genetic markers, but there are other markers that we're also looking at, to see who benefits from more intensive therapy, who should have less intensive therapy because, you know, you could spare toxicity with that and they're still likely to respond, who should get certain types of therapies. You know, maybe some patients are more likely to respond well to certain types of therapies. Other patients are more likely to have unacceptable toxicities with certain types of therapy. So it's really to inform treatment. This is very exciting in aplastic anemia. And uh, we're looking at these genetic markers. Sometimes they're inherited, sometimes they're sporadic. So I, I'm actually going to modify this when we post on the website. It's genetic markers that are predictive of response to immunosuppressive therapy uh, that can predict toxicities, risk of toxicities with transplant, and can predict risk of MDS and leukemia. There's also a lot of ongoing data. Uh, there's a beautiful publication that was a joint effort between investigators at the NIH and Japan where they looked at acquired genetic changes in the bone marrow. And there's a lot of other groups looking at this now, too. And right now, we just don't know yet how to use this information to help us figure out who we should be treating differently. Uh, but it's looking very promising. I think we need more data. We need more, um, we need more time. But again, to encourage you uh, to enroll on these studies, you know, it doesn't require any extra needle pokes. There's no extra procedures. It's just when you're already having marrow or blood drawn as part of your clinical care, you know, it, it, these studies study um, those samples that are already being um, obtained uh, and that would otherwise be thrown away in the garbage when, you know, the clinical testing is done. So we might as well learn something from these very precious samples. And if you have questions about these kinds of research, um, please let me know. So in the last few minutes, we'll talk about supportive care. So for uh, patients who have anemia, the transfusion is the supportive care of choice. 
Uh, we transfuse for symptoms, fatigue, exercise intolerance, where you can't suddenly, you can't go up a normal flight of stairs without becoming short of breath. Your heart is working extra hard. That's not good, especially if you're older and have heart problems. Headache can be a sign that your brain isn't getting enough oxygen, lightheadedness. And then if you're a child, if you're very anemic, you don't grow very well, right? So um, there are risks, of course, to transfusion. So you only transfuse if you're going to have benefit from it. Um, so certainly patients who have symptoms um, would have huge benefit from a transfusion. But there are, of course, small risks. Um, the big one that we worry about is, you know, some patients develop antibodies against the transfused blood cells, uh, be they red cells or platelets. In this case, they rapidly destroy the cells. And once they develop those antibodies, sometimes they continue to, to destroy any transfused cells. So this is a very scary complication, It's not seen very commonly, but something to be aware of. If someone has chronic red cell transfusion, so they require transfusions for a long time, uh, they can develop iron overload. So it turns out that our bodies have no way to get rid of, have very inefficient ways of getting rid of excess iron. And so um, over time, unless you get treatment with something called Desferol or X-Jade or there are new agents coming out now, uh, with, unless you get treatment, uh, you're going to start storing this extra iron in important organs, such as uh, your liver, your heart, your pituitary gland, other endocrine organs, um, your pancreas, uh, your thyroid, uh, well, actually not so much the thyroid, it's more in the pituitary. Um, so it can cause all kinds of problems, and it can be fatal if iron overload is so high, particularly in the liver and the heart, that the liver doesn't function right or the heart develops heart failure or arrhythmias. So uh, you don't want uh, to allow iron overload to get so high that it causes problems. Now, usually, if you're just getting transfusion support for a year or so, it's not usually that big a problem, but it's worth making sure that this is being paid attention to and uh, that treatment is being instituted um, early before complications occur. Low platelet counts, of course, can be supported with transfusion. Again, we transfuse if you're having symptoms, such as bleeding or increased bruising. Uh, we do sometimes give platelet transfusions, even if you don't have symptoms, uh, if your risk of bleeding is high, such as, for example, you're about to have surgery or you're a toddler and you're trying to learn how to walk and you're banging your head all the time, right? We will, we will be more careful with those patients. Um, and if there's a patient with a history of a lot of bleeding, they're just showing us that they don't tolerate low platelet counts very well, and so we will often transfuse to keep the platelet counts higher. The key point is, if there's bleeding, we need to make sure that it, uh, people aren't just thinking about the platelets. There are other things that can cause bleeding. For example, vitamin K deficiency or liver problems can cause an increased risk of bleeding. Um, so don't just always only focus on the platelet count. Um, and also, there are other agents in, inter in addition to platelet transfusions uh, that can help stabilize um, uh, sort of the clots that form to, to stop bleeding, uh, and they're called antifibrinolytic anti <laughs> agents, and these are oral agents that can be helpful to stop or prevent bleeding. Neutropenia can be treated with something called GCSF or Neupogen or Filgrastin. Uh, these are subcutaneous injections given daily or every few days. Uh, and these are typically given for patients who have recurrent or severe infections in the context of very low neutrophil counts. There was a large randomized study done in Europe where they showed that adding GCSF to treatment for aplastic anemia really didn't improve outcomes. Um, so uh, we don't do it routinely. Uh, now, how do we follow up? Let's say you've gotten your treatment. The follow-up post-treatment will depend on whether you've got a transplant or ATG cyclosporin or other medical therapy. So I'm going to focus on uh, follow-up after medical therapy because follow-up after transplant is uh, dependent on the transplant uh, center. But often after transplant, you might get a couple of marrows, bone marrow exams, but after that, if you've engrafted, you now have a healthy marrow, and follow-up is not focused on the bone marrow usually. It's, you know, you get blood counts, uh, and you may get some other testing, but uh, we're not so worried about 
relapse. Um, uh, in contrast, uh, if you've got ATG and cyclosporin or other medical therapies, we do worry about risk of relapse and we worry about progression to sort of pre-leukemia or leukemia. So most people will get a bone marrow exam after they've completed therapy. Um, or if they're still on therapy, there will be periodic bone marrow exams. Um, the question is not clear whether patients should undergo regular bone marrow exams um, after they've completed therapy. Um, and the rationale for routine bone marrow exams is if you catch uh, MDS early before it has progressed to leukemia, the outcomes are better, right? The outcomes and survival and uh, are, are better. Uh, but we don't know if we improve outcomes by doing regular surveillance. So my personal approach has been to have a very open discussion with the patient and in my case, families, because I take care of children, uh, to see, uh, to be very open with them about the data, about uh, leukemia risk. I also assess each individual patient, because each patient will have sort of different risks. And we will together partner with the family and the patient to come up with the best uh, regimen for them. Uh, now, there, there is no wiggle room. I will not uh, negotiate with families if the blood counts fall without an apparent cause, because then I know we need to do a marrow. Because if the blood counts fall and where there's not an apparent cause, it could be relapse, and maybe we just need to start ATG and cyclosporin again. But it's also possible that they could be developing MDS or leukemia, and we would not want to treat with ATG and cyclosporin necessarily for that. So. The other caveat that I raise is some people come and they're like, oh, you know, my blood counts were low, but I had a viral infection. My doctor thought it was just, you know, because the virus was suppressing the bone marrow function, so, um, you know, we didn't do anything. That's fine, except that you need to make sure that after uh, you've gotten over your viral infection that your blood counts have returned back to normal. I just had a patient with uh, a different kind of bone marrow failure syndrome who presented with a virus, low blood counts, uh, and very appropriately, you know, they waited to see if the blood counts recovered, but um, they never actually got around to checking that the blood counts recovered. The patient got better, and uh, it turned out that the patient actually not only had a viral infection, they had MDS, and eventually, you know, that came up. But, um, you know, you, you want to kind of make sure that you catch things, so you catch it nice and early before the leukemia develops. Uh, and then lastly, a little plug for taking an active role in your care. Be proactive. Seek consultation at specialty centers with expertise in aplastic anemia. Do not be shy. This is very common to seek consultation. And often you just need consultation. You can go back to your primary center, and those two centers can often work in partnership. You don't have to move you know, to some place far away from where you live necessarily. Um, we, we are very happy to work in partnership with your primary hematologist locally. This is okay to do. Some people worry that they're going to offend their doctor. Uh, most doctors uh, are fine with this. And my, I've had my patients, not for aplastic anemia usually, but for other disorders that are rare, uh, want, I've sometimes encouraged them to go see other specialists and even made recommendations about people they should see. I think we need to work as a team. What matters is the patient. Really, we should all be working together in partnership to do whatever is best for you, the patient. Um, I would also encourage you to participate in studies. Uh, it's, um, it's how we move forward. It may help you. Uh, and it's been shown actually in pediatric oncology that patients on study uh, do better than patients not on study. And, uh, you know, that's maybe because um, the the treatments and the surveillance is regimented, right? There's a standard way that we do things, and maybe that's helpful. I don't know. But um, it can be sometimes helpful for you to participate in studies, but it certainly helps um, our understanding of aplastic anemia in general. Don't be shy about asking questions, right? So if uh, a recommendation is made for a certain treatment, it's very reasonable to ask, what are, there, are there any other options? And why are you recommending this particular option as opposed to the other options? It's not that you're questioning your doctor's judgment. You're just asking to understand their reasoning, their rationale, and asking to, for the information that your doctor's using to guide their recommendation, which is very reasonable. 
And then uh, regular follow-up, even after you've completed treatment, can be helpful to learn about new advances in the field that might be helpful for your medical care. So I have some patients who've completed their treatment for aplastic anemia with ATG cyclosporin, doing great, fabulous blood counts, but I still see them back periodically, maybe once a year, maybe every couple of years, just so that we touch base so that um, I, I make sure that things are still going well and I can share with them any new information that might have come up that might affect, uh, you know, the type of surveillance we do or um, anything else that they might want to know. So it can be helpful. And lastly, I want to thank Dr. Fareed Boulad. I, I uh, acknowledged him in many of these slides uh, that he shared with me, um, so particularly the transplant slides um, that he kindly shared with me um, to share with you uh, in these types of presentations. So many thanks to Dr. Boulad. So I think we have time now for questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sherman Moore, for a very wonderful presentation. We did get uh, a few questions that have come through. Uh, our first question comes from Jeffrey, and Jeffrey would like to know, how do you go about finding a genetic expert with an understanding of aplastic anemia? We have a child with no developmental delays in which they have found a RAD21 mutation. Um, he would like to know who can t uh, Sorry. He said uh, they found a RAD21 mutation. Um, and he's asking, who can tell us how this is a, related to her aplastic anemia? Yes. So it depends on where you are. There are centers around the country that specialize in these sort of disorders. Uh, so uh, one thing you could do is ask uh, your um, hematologist whether there's a genetic center available. Uh, but uh, let me try to think of some random centers around the country. So we in Boston, of course, see many patients in consultation. On the adult and pediatric side, I have uh, sort of genetic partners uh, over on the adult side with expertise in bone marrow failure, aplastic anemia, and genetics. Uh, MD Anderson is looking at this. The University of Chicago has a center. Um, uh, the University of Washington has a center. Um, there are many centers, growing numbers of centers across the country uh, that are looking at this. So Baylor has a center. Uh, so I'm just throwing some out. I'm just trying to think of centers across the country. I'm not trying to exclude centers, but um, uh, just to give you an idea. And you're also welcome to contact our center with a, a request for recommendation. If you tell us where you live, you can ask us, is there a center nearby that we can go to? And we're happy to help direct you. So um, there are a lot of resources available for you. Yes, and for Jeffrey, if you're still in the audience, you can definitely also contact us um, via help at aamds.org. Um, and our patient educator can connect you with Dr. Shimmer Mora and make that um, connection um, for you. Uh, our next question comes from Donna. Donna's uh, asking, uh, her, her grandson was diagnosed with aplastic anemia when he was six years old. Uh, he is now 19. Uh, he was treated with ATG cyclosporine, and she is asking, what are the long-term effects, and could there be any future infertility problems? Okay, great question. So uh, good news is there have not been fertility issues with ATG and cyclosporin. Uh, none have been reported, and we've been using this now for many, many years, and I've used it in little tiny children and older children um, and young adults, uh, as well as, you know, my colleagues have used it in older people. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, match sibling transplant, uh, also no problems with infertility. And with the new matched unrelated donor transplants, we're also not seeing problems with fertility, although it is a theoretical concern, you know, so that's worth discussing with your doctor depending on the type of regimen that they use. Um, but uh, the regimen so far has been looking very, very promising, even with transplant. Well, with ATG and cyclosporin, I have no concerns there. In terms of long-term effects, that is a great question. There is limited data in pediatrics. We have formed in the United States the North American Pediatric Aplastic Anemia Consortium called NAPAC. And we are in the middle of analyzing data. We just did a big uh, study to ask exactly this kind of question. Are there any long-term effects from ATG and cyclosporin in children? because uh, most of the data in the literature is from adults. So stay tuned. We, will, uh, we are running this analysis now. We hope to be done with the analysis in the next few months. 
uh, and making the data public. So um, stay tuned. But I, I'm not aware in the literature, uh, really the issues have been, uh, to my knowledge, uh, if there has been kidney problems with cyclosporin, that can be a problem. Uh, so that's the big one that I've seen coming up. And then, you know, if he's still on cyclosporin, there can be immune issues with ongoing cyclosporin. But once he's off all the medications, you know, hopefully the immune situation is, is good. But it hasn't been systematically carefully studied. So the short answer is stay tuned. But I'm not aware. If there was something big that we needed to be aware of, I would have thought it would have come out by now. There have been studies through Europe, some big uh, studies of pediatric patients with aplastic anemia, uh, and those have looked very encouraging. Uh, the major issues have been relapse, uh, MDS, um, and uh, you know progression to leukemia. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Christine. Christine's son was treated for aplastic anemia with ATG cyclosporine in March 2015. His counts returned to normal, and he has been regularly followed up with blood tests since that time. Recently, in December 2016, his blood tests showed low white cells and low neutrophil count. No action has been taken, but they continue to monitor his blood tests. Uh, she is asking, should further examination be undertaken? Right. So this, I think you're getting at the general question of uh, when do you decide to do a bone marrow uh, when the blood counts are dropping? And it depends on many factors. Uh, it depends in part on how low they've fallen. So sometimes they fall a little bit, but then they stop and they're still in a good range. So uh, if that's the case, then we'll often just sit tight and and follow it. If you know they haven't dropped that much, it's not significant. Um, uh, if they fall uh, below certain parameters, so, you know, different doctors will use different parameters. There's no sort of standard parameters, but I think one that commonly doctors use is uh, a neutrophil count less than 1,500. We start to pay more attention to that, um, especially if there's no cause. Now, there are a lot of causes for low neutrophil counts. One of them is medications. Right, so if he's on medications, might take a look at what those are. Sometimes uh, infections can do that. Um, sometimes other health issues can do that. So you know, it's worth taking a quick peek. But I should also say that neutrophil counts can bounce around uh, a lot. Uh, of all the blood counts, that's probably one of the ones that bounces around the most. Uh, and so it's really important to look over time. But it sounds like it's been, I guess, two months now. Uh, the other thing we look at is. Uh, the trajectory of the drop. So if they've dropped, it's only a little drop, but then they stabilize. That's much more reassuring than if they drop and then they are continuing to drop. Um, so uh, I don't know if that was uh, enough of an answer, but um, it's also worth asking. That, and sometimes I've appreciated it as a physician when a patient asks me directly, uh, why am I not doing a marrow now? What would trigger me to do a marrow? Because then uh, I can explain to them my reasoning. So sometimes it's not, it doesn't occur to me that my reasoning isn't clear to the patient. And frankly, it's, it's uh, sometimes hard as a physician to know the style of the patient. There are some patients who want all the information, and there are other patients who just get stressed out with extra information. They just want to know what they need to know, and they don't want to hear the rest of it. It just stresses them out. So it's helpful for you as a patient to indicate to your doctor what you are looking for because then they know, oh, you're the kind of patient who wants this kind of information. Um, it can be very helpful speaking as a physician. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, our next question comes from Lee, and Lee is asking, is there a standard uh, for monitoring patients with aplastic anemia who have completed ATG treatment? That is a great question. So to get at that on the pediatric side, we actually did a study which we published um, and asked, uh, you know, across the across the United States and part of Canada, uh, at the major sort of hematology centers, how do you follow patients with aplastic anemia after they're done with treatment? And the answers were all over the place. <laughs> the reason that the answers are all over the place is there's no data, there's no evidence to guide how we should be monitoring 
uh, and there's no standards. So uh, part of the study that we're doing now through NAPAC is to try to gather evidence to help inform us how we should be monitoring patients post-treatment. So the short answer is uh, it's all over the place, um, the, uh, uh, but we're trying to improve that through studies uh, in the North American Pediatric Aplastic Anemia Consortium. Uh, and also, it is individualized based on the patient. So, for example, most of us will follow a patient much more closely if they've only had a partial response to ATG and cyclosporine, where the counts are better, they're not transfusion dependent, but they're not that high. You know, so uh, platelet counts less than 100,000, uh, neutrophil count less than 1,000, uh, hemoglobin less than you know, um, it usually it, it'll vary, but around 10, you know, those patients, many of us will follow much more closely and sometimes we'll consider checking a marrow periodically if the counts are really low. So it's still responding, but the counts are really low, platelet counts, you know, less than 50,000, uh, hemoglobin less than, you know, eight, uh, neutrophil count less than 500. Those patients I do watch much more closely um, because often what I worry about is that the marrow may have been maybe sicker than a marrow that recovers completely, and so I need to watch it a little bit more carefully. So uh, those are just general guide guidelines. Uh, it's hard to make a specific recommendation for a specific patient. Do not panic. If your blood counts are still kind of low after ATG and cyclosporine, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're at higher risk for complications. Um, but I do monitor a little more closely just in case. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Karen, and she actually has two questions, um, but we're going to start uh, with this one. And she is asking, can a 31-year-old um, who's been diagnosed with aplastic anemia since he was nine years old, be able to take a trauma pack. He did not have a bone marrow transplant, but had four courses of ATG cyclosporine. Ah, so you're asking, is there, so he, I take it that he hasn't responded to four rounds of ATG and cyclosporine and is still refractory. If that's the question, so I'm rephrasing it the way I understand it, Refractory aplastic anemia, there is no contraindication to trying l Um Indeed, in the initial studies from NIH, many of those patients had refractory aplastic anemia for many years with many attempts at different types of therapy. So um, I think that uh, it's definitely worth a try. I would, of course, recommend, as with anybody else, uh, prior to starting a new therapy, get a baseline bone marrow evaluation to make sure that going into it, you know what the marrow looks like and there's nothing, um, you know, worrisome that might cause you to think about a different type of treatment. So um, with that caveat, I don't see any contraindication. And indeed, those are the types of patients who were treated with l uh in the publications. Okay, thank you. And Karen's second question uh, is, and correct me if I'm wrong in pronouncing this, uh, she's asking, can rhabdomyolysis occur easier in aplastic anemia patients? Um, his red cell blood counts range in the 10.5 to 12.5 range. Uh, so uh, rhabdomyolysis refers to um, basically uh, damage or uh, destruction of the muscle cells. Um, and so that I've not seen in uh, aplastic anemia, no spontaneous rhabdomyolysis in aplastic anemia. Uh, without any kind of treatment, um, that would be due to something else. Uh, if there's hemolysis, uh, which refers to destruction of red blood cells, that can be caused by lots of different things. Um, and PNH is one that we worry a lot about in patients with aplastic anemia as a cause of red blood cell destruction. So if somebody had clear evidence of hemolysis, uh, there's a broad range of things that can cause that, but one of them is PNH, so that should be tested. Since we're talking about PNH and um, testing, uh, the next question 
uh, that came in is asking, should all aplastic anemia patients be tested for PNH, and if so, how often? Ah, so that's a great question. We asked that in our survey as well. We, I think it's without question, there was consensus in the study that I mentioned to you across North America. Everybody tests for PNH up front, right? So at diagnosis, uh, it is very, it is appropriate to test for PNH because it will change your treatment management if you see a big PNH clone, right? Um, but after that, uh, it's variable. Uh, some people test for PNH every year. Some people test only if there's uh, clinical suspicion. Um, so there's a lot of variation there. Uh, so it's worth asking your doctor what they do uh, and why. And if what I've done as a physician is sometimes in the discussion it becomes clear to me that the patient is very worried about something that I'm not worried about. But if there's a simple test, I will often partner with the patient and periodically run that test so that we can look at it together uh, because it's not wrong to test for PNH every year. I was talking to colleagues in Japan, and they do test for PNH every year because they've seen patients pop up with PNH, symptomatic PNH. I've not seen that so much in the pediatric population, uh, but it's such a simple blood test to do that, uh, you know, it's not unreasonable to do it. But I would absolutely do it if I saw any clinical signs of hemolysis or any concern for blood clots. Uh, and in somebody with relapsed aplastic anemia, I do run that test again. All right, thank you. And we have uh, time for just a, a few more questions. Um, our next question comes from Charles, and he actually has two questions. Uh, he would like to know, uh, how do you enroll into the Acquired Genetic Change Study? Oh, so there are several uh, centers uh, studying that, and I think the Aplastic Anemia Foundation uh, probably can direct you to some. We can help with that, too. So the NIH is running such a, t uh, a study. We here in Boston, in collaboration with the Broad Institute, which has done, I think, the pioneering work in MDS, uh, together with some of the other centers across the world, um, are doing that for aplastic anemia. Uh, so those are two that I know of right off the top of my head. Uh, but if you, uh, and uh, the nice thing is samples can be shipped to the center for study. Um, so you don't have to come visit or, you know, do any traveling. Uh, we can ship you a mailer. Uh, and I'm sure there are other centers as well uh, that are studying these. Um, so I'm happy to speak with you if you want to get in touch with me about further studies. Yes, and we can definitely do that uh, if uh, you contact us, Charles. Um, our patient educator is happy to uh, be the liaison for that. And for anyone that has any further questions that we may not have time for, um, please email us at help, H-E-L-P at A-M-D-S dot org, um, so that we can answer your questions. Um, and Charles' last question uh, was, do you recommend a bone marrow transplant, uh, and specifically a 10 out of 10 match, if a patient has partial response to, NI, to the NIH treatment, um, his platelet levels is in the 60s. Ah, so that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to give you a corollary to your question. So with a platelet count of 60, with the other counts completely fine, we typically would not recommend that you go through the risks of a unrelated donor transplant because you can live a Pretty good. You can have a pretty good lifestyle with a platelet count of 60,000. As long if you're having a lot of bleeding with a platelet count of 60,000, that would warrant further workup because that would be unusual and some discussion. But you know, we can take someone from being a healthy, you know, functional person to someone with debilitating graft-versus-host disease with an unrelated donor transplant. So most of us are reluctant to do it for someone who is otherwise doing well with pretty good blood counts, albeit abnormal. I've had an, I have had a different situation where I've had young athletic teenagers come to me with platelet counts of 20 or 30,000, right, after ATG cyclosporin. So they don't need transfusions, but they can't live a normal, you know, they can't live an active life with that. Uh, they want to do sports, and they have begged me for transplants. And, you know, that's a much more complicated discussion. Um, so... Uh, it really, I think the big picture answer to your question is it, this warrants a discussion with your doctor about the risks of the transplant versus the risks of not doing the transplant. 
And that risk-benefit ratio will vary for each patient, dependent not only on medical issues, but also on their personal values and what they value in life. So um, it's a complicated discussion, but typically for a platelet count of 60,000, I think most centers would not do a transplant because the risks of transplant could be that we could make you sicker than you are. Than, uh, we could take you from being a pretty healthy, functional person to being someone who has uh, debilitating complications from transplant. Okay, thank you. And we have time for one more question. Uh, this comes from Lee. And Lee is asking, my parents would like to travel within the U.S. this summer to visit family and friends. Are there any precautions they should take while traveling? They would be traveling uh, some by plane and some by train. Uh, so I'm not sure I understand the context of it. Uh, Let's see. If you're, if one of your parents had a plastic anemia, uh, so if the question is, are there um, travel precautions for patients with a plastic anemia? Uh, yes. it could, uh, then it would depend on uh, the severity of the blood count, uh, the blood counts, and um, which blood counts are low. So most patients can travel with low platelet counts, uh, depending on how low they are, often will give patients a transfusion prior to their travel, and they make it back before their platelets drop again, and we give them a little note to take with them so that if they experience bleeding while they're traveling, they can go to a local emergency room and have some information, and it includes our beeper number so that they can page us if there's a problem. Uh, red cells last a really long time, so we can often sort of tank people up with red cells before they travel. Uh, neutrophils are more complicated, and it depends on the severity of the neutropenia uh, and whether patients are likely to be symptomatic. And there are different things we can do for that. Um, uh, so it's a little bit too complicated for me to go over on the phone the different types of options because it's so complicated, but some generic options sometimes, and it, many of them are inappropriate for certain types of situations, so please don't go to your doctor and say, I said that these were what they should do, because it's very specialized, but prophylactic antibiotics, GCSF, um, certainly Purell, good, you know, particularly on an airplane, use Purell. Um, these are all things that could be considered, but are inappropriate in many situations, so you have to talk to your doctor about it. Absolutely. Well, I believe that's all the time that we have today. Uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Sherman Moore, for your wonderful presentation and for your time. I would also just like to add uh, that if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today and for making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P, at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond, or visit our online academy at aamds.org slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.